super quick. Uh, <laughs> what are you saying? Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Now we've never done this, but I also need to make sure I talk about So if you can't hear me, uh, speak up and just say, hey, talk louder. Um, so let's get going with some prayer requests and praises. Does anybody have anything on their radar they want to say? Please continue to pray for my brother. He's doing better, but he still needs lots of prayer. Others? But Henry Coker on the list, he's supposed to have back surgery on Tuesday. Was it Henry what? Coulter. Coulter. A lot of people know it. My sister Kathy, uh, she had her second knee operation and she came home the same day they did the operation. So she did well through the operation, but if we could pray for her to continue. Others. Jeff, I don't even know how to pray for this, but <laughs> since the election, uh -huh. I've had the feeling that God gave us four more years of freedom mm -hmm. in our religion, being able to worship and everything. And I just feel like we need to be doing something taking advantage of these next four years. I think God's going to be disappointed in us if we just all sit back and be lazy. Sure. Yep. But I don't really know how to even pray for that. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, we'll definitely pray for leaders. We'll definitely pray and, um, you know, boldness. We need boldness. Right. Boldness and uh, you we know, have to push forth the, the Christian agenda more so than even the conservative agenda. So we'll, uh, we'll pray on it. Yeah, I'm more concerned about the Christian agenda than right. the conservative. Okay. Others? Just continue to pray for all the people that are still okay. suffering from this storm. Okay. And I know a lot of people, they're having trouble with their, you know, just getting in. There's so many that are affected that the insurance companies are really slow and FEMA and all that. Sure. Just that, uh, you know, continue to pray for them that sure. they can get the help they need sooner than later and um, just continue to give them strength sure. to get through that. Others? Give praise that Billy was particularly powerful this morning <laughs> and right on the mark. I just thought it was very uplifting kind of beat up David a little bit lately and he <laughs> redeemed himself this morning. It was a, I just thought he did a great job this yeah, morning. Yeah, there's always a lot there that you don't see on first read and Billy's really good at pulling that out. So. I didn't know there were so many giants. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I wasn't really paying attention to because I thought about giants. Like, what?
believe that's what Billy is going to be, where he's going to be at. So he'll be talking to people. Um, where is that? Orlando. Jane, Jane, Jane there somewhere. You know, the other details on uh, that conference. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. Sounds like a good thing. And <coughs> what's that? Any other prayers? Prayers and reads. Yeah. I also have a phrase that uh, my lung spots that I had on my lung are gone. Okay. Oh, right. that's that's crazy. Crazy. And my hot monitor I had to work for uh, wear for two weeks was good. I had two good results in two days. Amen. Oh, yeah. Definitely showing us mercy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, let's go to prayer. Lord, thank you for another wonderful day, uh, another day of worship, uh, the ability to gather together here uh, without fear of persecution. Thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done and continue to do for us. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for the health of uh, the folks in our church and all this that you're taking care of. Uh, Please continue to watch over us. Hear our prayers, Lord. Uh, Help us to uh, remain healthy so that we can uh, use that to uh, pursue your works and and lead others to you ultimately. Um, Watch over all those who have medical ailments and they're they're feeling sick, they're feeling hurt, they're weak. Um, Lord, be with them, encourage them in their down times. Um, help us all to ultimately turn toward you in these in those times and seasons. Um, but ultimately, Lord, we do pray for healing uh, that all would be made well. Um, we want to pray for um, hurricane and disaster relief. Uh, all the those who are affected by that and all the fallout from it, Lord, businesses affected, lives affected. Uh, again, uh, give peace to everyone that uh, has been impacted by that situation. Lord, help us to again keep our eyes firmly fixed on you uh, and realize that things in this world are, are fleeting. You are forever. Uh, and through it all, that we can have peace. Um, thank you for uh, the message today from Billy. Thank you for uh, our leadership and those who are actively at work in our church, guiding us, shepherding us, and making sure that we stay on track, Lord. Uh, we pray that our church is a blessing to you as you bless us so, uh, so ceaselessly. Um, thank you again, Lord. Uh, bless our time tonight. Please uh, help me as I bring uh, this, this passage forward and that uh, only truths would be remembered if I misspeak, that others would be uh, correcting Lord, that ultimately it would only be truth coming forward. Um, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, I pray all things. Amen. 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 Okay, so we are going to go into uh, Romans 7 tonight. And so thinking through this, the backstory on why it's Romans, uh, I had been doing a Bible study with my dad. And so we were working through the book of Romans and uh, been reading through it over the last couple of months taking my time and I kind of thought like well Billy came yesterday and he was like hey if you're not going to go to the conference would you mind doing a, a study and so I thought okay well I'll do something light so let me think of something on Romans and so uh, of doctrine. yeah and so I was, I was trying to think on what we could do and um, the end of Romans 7 uh, I reflect on a lot which is the uh, you know the wretched man that I am and you know that, that's kind of a phrase that I kind of echoed in my head a lot. So um, I thought on that, and I was like, well, maybe maybe we'll look at doing that chapter. And then, as you go into that chapter, there's, there's a ton there. So what we're really going to be focusing on today is going to be uh, Romans 14 through 25, or sorry, 14 through 24. Um, but we'll start out with reading uh, a larger chunk than that. Um, so a couple things on this. Uh, the, the goal of this is to understand our nature, our human nature, um, hopefully to relieve us of some, some guilt that we may have as we reflect on uh, our iniquities, and then uh, also gain a perspective on not just pushing that aside, but using that uh, conviction of sin to you know, drive us to be better. So, uh, so before we get going and we read, 
have a few questions. So, who here would say they want to be perfect in the practice of their faith? Who would wants to be perfect? Okay, that's a pretty easy question. Everybody's going to say yes to that one. So, um, the next question, is it possible to be perfect in the practice of your faith? No. Yeah. I don't think so. Not, not perfect. Okay. All right. Also another one there. So, who has experienced or witnessed um, a person that comes to faith, baptized by the Spirit, who has observed, like, it seems like an overnight change in someone's life, where it's like day and night, that's a completely different person, who's either experienced it or seen it? Eddie. We are pretty much there, yeah. Eddie's a good one. Um, Kevin has had a massive change. I didn't really know him before, but from what I hear, uh, he's nothing like what he is now, so... Is actually helping his witness because all these men knew him before, yeah. right. and they yep. know him now, and yep. so they know something is going on in his life. Mm -hmm. Now, so we see we see this progress. We see people making drastic leaps. We still see that there is there's still besetting sin. So there's still the day to day sin that you're going to be struggling with, even though you're going to see people taking these massive leaps of faith. Um, in massive leaps in their walk, expressing it more, uh, more in tune with the spirit. So, um, so we're going to look at that deeper, exactly what's happening there, and kind of understand it. So let's go ahead and go to uh, Romans seven. Let's start with uh, actually one more question before we go into that. We've all read Romans seven, right? Is there anybody here not read Romans seven? Okay. Uh, who here feels pretty confident with? at least vaguely, what Romans is like talking about, broadly speaking. Does anybody like really feel like they've studied Romans a good bit? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. So then I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to give you a quick stab at the summary here. So based on some of the folks, Sproul and Piper primarily are the two guys I was reading and listening to a whole lot prepping for this. And um, so combined with them and kind of reading through, like I said, working through the study with my dad, here's kind of what I came as the, so far, what I've kind of gleaned as the overarching uh, takeaway from Romans. What is Romans as a book all about? So I hold that Romans, uh, what it does is it describes that all human beings have fallen short of the glory of God. All people are under wrath. Nevertheless, in Jesus, God provided sinners the necessary sacrifice in order to attain salvation. And then, having understood this, there are some practical applications and, um, and basically situations that we can pull out of that and then apply to our lives. So, um, so that's what we're looking at in Romans, broadly speaking. Where we're jumping into here uh, in Romans 7, basically leading up to this, Paul has talked about um, how... People are the, the sin that's in the world, how people can clearly perceive sin, um, basically what, uh, you know, and, and then ultimately through Jesus, what, uh, what we have and what we, can, what we can have by accepting him. Um, and so getting in here to about the kind of middle of this book, right before we get into some of the, uh, you know, kind of more challenging doctrine, this kind of borders right along the, the edge of that. Um, this really comes in a little bit more on um, kind of Paul reflecting a little bit. So let's go ahead and can someone read Romans 7, 7 to 24? 7 to 24. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet it, it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to cover if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, 
killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to me to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. For now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nobody good, nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, and my lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched men that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Thank you, Ted. Okay, so uh, the law of sin is, uh, is what we're really uh, driving home here. And uh, if it's if you're thinking anything like I was thinking when I read through this, there's a lot of, like, the language, it sounds like he's saying the same thing over and again, over again. If I do not do what I want, if I do what I want, I don't do what I do not want. It's like, what are you trying to get at here, Paul? There's, there's a lot of twisting of the words in it. Even when you read it, it sounds like, did I just read the same line on repeat? So, um, and there has to be a good reason for this, so that's what we're going to try to kind of uh, pull out of this. So, um, the reason we started out in... Uh, and seven was just to kind of get the, the flow of, of where we're going from, um, you know, from Paul's perspective and then tying in here where we start out in 14. So, so from 14, we're getting, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So the first thing we have to do is define the terms. So what is the law? The law that Paul's talking about here. Jewish law? The Jewish law? Is that what he's talking about? It, yeah. More specifically, though, like what exactly is the Jewish law? The Mosaic, Mosaic law. Mosaic law, Ten Commandments. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So we have the, uh, there's three aspects to it. You have the moral law, you have the uh, civil laws, and then you have the ceremonial laws, which are all laid out basically in the first five books of the Bible. Um, primarily here, Paul is, is going to be getting at the the spiritual ethical implications uh, of, of sin. So really it's all kind of coming down to the moral law. That's really what he's going to be talking about when he says the law uh, throughout these throughout these sections here. Um, so that's so that's what we're working on again. So if you're thinking law, just just think about the Ten Commandments, that'd be a fine way to kind of at least get a um, a broad strokes picture of like, okay, what are you what are you referencing back to here, Paul? Okay, so uh, so we have law. Alright, what is the flesh? Human nature. Human nature? Yep. Yeah. And, and, and our heart sin, or, you know, we're sinners because we're of the flesh. Yeah. And uh, it's our sinful nature that we were born with so since Adam. 100%. Yep. <laughs> Human nature is definitely, definitely a piece to it. Um, there's one other aspect to it. Any thoughts? The other aspect. Pretty obvious the, the other aspect. Huh? The physical body. The physical body, exactly. So your physical body and then human nature. Okay. <coughs> there's there's a couple other things that we'll that we'll kind of talk about as we get into the flesh, but the big two things here that we're looking at. Physical body and the nature. This human nature. Okay, so um, 
So we got physical body, or excuse me, we got the we got the law, we got the flesh, and now the last part to this uh, sold under sin. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. What exactly does it mean that he is sold under sin? Any thoughts on that? It seems like a it seems like just a a, a pretty big statement. Um, uh, upon first read, I kind of saw it and I was like, all right, yeah, generally speaking, I kind of get what you're saying there. Um, but whenever you kind of pull this out, there's a bit more there. Any thoughts? Yeah. Well, my Bible says, sold into slavery to mm-hmm. sin. Yeah. Conserving under its control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we're gonna we're gonna push into here. So um, there's a few verses here that I want to pull from. So can I have one person pull up First Kings twenty one twenty? First Kings twenty one twenty. You got that one? Okay. Uh, Second Kings seventeen seven. You want to take that one? Okay. Isaiah fifty verse one. I got you. Got that one. And then Isaiah 52, verse 3. Okay, want to take that one? Okay. Whenever we got the 1 Kings 21 20, uh, go ahead and hit it. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. And this happened because of the sin. So again, happened because of sin. Next one, Isaiah 50, verse 1. Yep. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce? with which I sent her away, or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. For your iniquities you were sold. Isaiah 52, 3. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. Sold for nothing. So empty being sold for something empty. So pulling all of these things together that we can we can understand then that sold under sin is meaning due to our sin we have been given over these clear examples all throughout the Bible here given over because of the transgression okay so we have the we know the law spiritual we're of the flesh we're sold under sin due to the flesh into verse 15 so for I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Has anyone ever sinned? Has anyone ever sinned? Yeah, that's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, thought, <laughs> and thought after doing that, like why or in the middle of it, uh, why am I doing it? this? What yes. what exactly is happening here? Yes. Um, I it has to be a common experience, right? Um, I was uh, oftentimes in my job. I'll notice that I'm like a micro liar. I will. Uh, somebody will ask me a question, and a client will ask me a question, and I will, uh, and I'll just be like, yeah, 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 yeah we, we can do that. Even though I don't even necessarily know if my company's capable of doing the thing that they're asking me to do, but I'm just saying it because I, I know it's irrelevant, and, I, and so it's just kind of like, let's just get through this. There's no point in doing that, though. And that's the thing. So even when I'm doing it, I'm like, man, why did I, why did I just do that? 
it had zero impact on the outcome of, of the situation. Um, so the the thing that Paul's expressing here is exactly that which we've experienced, you know, across the board. I don't understand exactly what I'm doing. He's not he's not popping out. He's just saying like, what, what is happening? I don't I don't understand why why I'm acting this way. Um, verse 16. Now, now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So broad strokes, okay. What does that tell us? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. What does that tell us about the law? What's it tell us about the law? It's a better way of thinking of it. If you follow the law, it's good. It's good, okay. It's going to be in the graces of God. If you don't follow the law, you're going to... Okay. Yep. The law acts as a mirror Thank to you. let you know when you've transgressed God's law. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's what we're that's the the main point I want to come in on there. So um, it shines light. The law itself shines light on on our actions. Um, it's talked about else, elsewhere in Romans where uh, the law condemns, and most of you probably already know this. Um, but when you recognize that you're doing something wrong, you're you're attesting to the law in recognizing your sin as well. So as a general rule of thumb, while we're not held to, bound to the law, it is it is good to reflect on the law and, and earnestly try to walk in it. So something to consider there. Uh, going into 17, okay, so so we have we got the law, we got the flesh, we understand exactly what you know the actions and, and the consequences of those actions. Um, what the law is doing as we reflect on the law. Um, so 17. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay. <laughs> so. The devil may be doing it. The devil may be doing it. Right? It's, kind of, it's kind of the first thought. Are we responsible for our actions? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, we are. Uh, but that kind of takes your responsibility away like it wasn't me it was sin right and so I don't understand that verse here I don't think that's what Paul is saying I think Paul is saying once you sin it takes over (coughs) if you allow it it will take over your life so it's the sin that has taken over that he's working to control like it will snowball if you don't Bingo. Sure. Yeah. Let's uh somebody somebody get me uh Galatians five sixteen and seventeen. Galatians five, sixteen and seventeen. Paul's words kinda of helps us. Uh, five, sixteen and seventeen. Yeah, Galatians five, sixteen and seventeen. I have it. Okay. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Mm-hmm. So, we are, we are of the flesh. We are of the flesh. And we have an indwelt spirit, okay, that is interacting with us, guiding us, and uh, and also convicting us, pointing us back, looking at, hey, look at the look at the law that, that was given prior to the spirit indwelling believers. Uh, so now we have two pieces: we have a spirit, and we have a law to reflect on uh, to help convict us of these things. Now, so it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So we need to figure out here exactly uh, is Paul is Paul trying to obviously in Galatians he's saying there's kind of this this kind of dichotomy of the the human nature that's that's at war. So are we responsible for it? So let's go here into uh, the, the other piece of this. Let's do this one real quick: um, the spiritual aspect and the non and the non physical aspect. Um, can someone read? First Thessalonians five twenty three. And while 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 somebody's getting there, 
523? Yeah, one, one second on that, I'll, I'll take you there. Uh, what he's about to read has a little bit more to it, where there's kind of three aspects that get pulled out here. Uh, that's something that I, it goes down a deep, deep rabbit hole if we go down into that, but I do want to point it out so that you're aware of it. And then uh, if you study on it and find anything, I would love to hear your thoughts on it because that's a, it's a can of worms. So uh, <laughs> go ahead, Ed, if you got Is it that. Is five or four? Uh, First that's the one means 523. There's no five. There's no five. Now made the God of Peace. Is that the way it started? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So let me go to, give me a, some we can do. First Thessalonians 5, 15 to 21. And then we need 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 6. So who, who can give me the first Thessalonians 5, 15 to 21? Yeah, thank you. And then somebody for 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 6. Thank you. Kevin, you're there. Go ahead. Is that Jeff? Do you have that one? Or sorry, who has that one for me? Oh, Phil, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 
I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first feared your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into the flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Fanning into flame. So, um, Fanning into flame. So there's this. The spirit is referred to as this as this flame that needs to be needs to be stoked and it needs to be it needs to be fanned up so that it just grows bright and hot and then from that it influences us. So um, so my point is, you see these uh, you see how Paul was recommending this to Timothy, Thessalonians. Don't quench the spirit. Fan this thing into flame. And then it's going to ultimately, what that's going to be able to do is help you uh, overcome the fleshly desires, which is what we're seeing is causing folks to stumble. So that's my thought there. Make sense? Does it seem like that works? Fair enough. Um, so that gets us through 18. Uh, so that took us there. All right, so 19 then. For, for I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. So we recognize we're going to continually do evil, and we don't want to do it. You don't want to do it, but you're going to keep doing it. So, 20. Now 20 says, Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. We just read this, didn't we? Okay, somebody... Um, Wayne, be ready with... Verse 16. Okay. What? Can you be ready to read verse 16 for me? In, in this? Yeah. Romans Romans 7, 16. Hold on that. Justin, will you will you have Romans 17 ready for me? And then uh, and Jeff, I'm gonna have you uh, with Romans 20. Okay? So I'm gonna call on you, you're gonna read, and I'm gonna call on the next person, they're gonna read, okay? So Wayne, go ahead and hit it. Verse 16. If I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Jeff, 20? Jeff. Now, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who did it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay, so we just used the same phrase twice in there. Justin, 17? So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Jeff, hit 20 again. Now if I do what I do... Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who did it, but sin that dwells within me. So, okay, so <laughs> verse 16 and verse 17 uses the exact same language verbatim that's used in verse 20. Why? Why would he do this? Thoughts? To confuse. To confuse. To confuse. And say, hey, you in case you miss this. What's that? You need to bring it off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, I think that's uh, that seems to be one of the things that Paul does. It's repetition is usually for driving home a point, um, and it must be a pretty significant point that he drives it home like within the, the frame of like three sentences. <laughs> so, what I think what I think the point of basically sixteen going up through twenty is is saying, "Hey, Christian in Rome, remember." It's not you doing the sin, but the sin that dwells within you. Hey, Christian, see your key. It's not you doing the sin, but the sin that dwells within you. In your innermost being, uh, it's not you. The real you, the, the best part of you, is the part that has conformed to the Spirit, and the Spirit is conforming to, um, to Him. And that's what's causing you to, to walk in, in the proper ways. Um, so I think, I really think what, what's coming out of that is, is basically saying, hey, you are this dirty sinner that's going to keep on sinning, but, but have some peace in it as well, because we know that um, we know that it's not, it's not actually you. It's that part of you that has yet to be renewed, but will be renewed eventually. So, um, I almost see it one slightly other way. Okay, go ahead. So I see it as you are going to sin because you are sinful, same beginning, but because you know the law, 
you, with this gift of intelligence of knowing it, you then will, like, you then should fight that sin that you will always do and desire to do good. And that's like where the practice comes in to fight, to fan the flame. But it's like, it's basically the same thing you're saying. I just see it like playing out. Yeah, I don't know. You're saying, yeah, know, you're, saying under, you're saying understanding the law is, say it one more time. So that you are a sinner. Yes. Believer of Jesus, you are not perfect. You are a sinner. Yeah. Um, follower, whatever. We don't have to do that. Uh-huh. <laughs> but because there is this law, and you know this law, it will shine light on your good and bad, and you will know what is good and bad. Yeah. And because of that, you will fight the sin that is within you to do what God desires. Yeah. yeah. So, and, so, but I just see it flowing like that. Okay. Spiritual warfare. So yeah. So so the only the only caveat there is you can recognize it, but you don't have the ability to to actually mm-hmm. do it. And so you need you need to have you need to let the Spirit work through you in order to be able to do it. So in your flesh, you can recognize that the law is good. Yeah. You just read that. But it doesn't mean you can do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is it's mm-hmm. grace. You're well, seeing grace. Yeah. You're seeing yeah. grace. Yeah. What's that? You're seeing grace. You're seeing grace. You're seeing grace. Mm-hmm. Um, but be advised that if you've done something wrong, yeah. God will always... You're still held accountable. Me and my buddies in college, uh, Green and Becca, I kind of knucklehead. But uh, <laughs> we had this joke, and uh, little did I know, I reflect on this all the time because we were saying something that's like really true. But we would, you know, after we did something ridiculous over the weekend, we'd, we'd say, well, one day we're going to have to, one day God's going to pull that up on the big screen. And, <laughs> and that's not going to look so good. And so the, the running joke we were saying was, oh boy, that's not going to look, look good on the big screen. <laughs> but it is a thing <laughs> as Christians. You're going to be held accountable for every single thought, word, uh, feeling, everything that you have expressed, uh, or everything. It's going to be put on display. So, yeah, but um, by the by, the grace of Jesus Christ, when you realize you've done wrong, yeah, just bow down and say, "Father, forgive me." Right, turn to repent. We're going to get there. <laughs> so, <laughs> you'll get an account of, of the sin. Right. But you will not be condemned for the sin. That's exactly. a very important point yep. because of Christ. Yep. Because he has taken that sin for us. Exactly. Yep. Yep. The propitiation. He is our righteousness. We don't have righteousness. It's a gift. And again, this is kind of highlighting that to us right now. We don't we can't be righteous. Billy talked about that this morning. We can't be righteous. Though from his righteousness, we can be caused to act in righteous ways. So, um, so we have brief flashes of it right now, but then more fully. So once we're actually in the final state, the glorification, the second coming, new earth, new heavens, new everything, that's when spirit and body will then finally be in the tomb. So right now, bodily, it's our anchor holding us down. Um, so your flesh and nature is causing you to sin. So 21 is the so what. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Okay, wants to do right, and every time it wants to do it, evil's lurking right around the corner. Um, twenty-two and twenty-three. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So. We have there basically the uh, kind of what I was talking about earlier, where I kind of kind of jumped ahead of things there. In our innermost being, your innermost being, that's who you really are in your innermost being. But there's another law <laughs> that's waging war constantly, daily, every day. What we get out of this is what leads us here to 24. Wretched man that I am. Pause there for a second. So I think that verse is very helpful to reflect on. It's something that uh, 
something that we should, that should be in the back of our mind basically every day. We should be, we, we should be thinking, man, ratchet. I'm, I'm doing bad. But we can't forget the second part of that. The second part of it is who will deliver me from this body of death? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so, so we have both pieces to it, okay? Daily, moment by moment, reflection on how spiritually poor we are. And again, daily, moment by moment, grace. So in your day-to-day life, ultimately, again, let the sin convict. Let it, let it squeeze you. Let it, let it hurt you. But ultimately, use it. Use it to recognize, okay, what's this pointing me to? This is pointing me to the law. I know from the law that it is good. I know that in me there's nothing good. Who is my good? My good is Jesus. So it's, your sin can work for your benefit by recognizing exactly why why you are doing it. So, um, the last bit here. So, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Is he saying, oh well, the flesh will sin, but my mind is on track. Is that what he's saying? It's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. He's repulsed, he's upset, and he is just, he's just sick of it. Um, and, and we should be too. Um, but he's also recognizing that the spiritual part of him, the real part of him, uh, is pursuing, is pursuing righteousness. So, and then Jamie, in preparation for uh, this, he told me that, boy, if you're going to read Romans 7, then you better get to 8. And so, <laughs> eight one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So are in them. Rest, rest, but use the sin. Takeaways: uh, every intent of every intent of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. Genesis six five. I'm pretty sure somebody said that pretty close to the beginning of this. Um, at our core, at the core of our 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 flesh, our human nature bodies, we are we are wretched. We're sinners. We deserve help. Reflect on it. Don't let it upset you too, too much, though, because there's there's the other side. We have the spirit that leads us to be as well. Um, I've already said this point time and time again, so I'm not going to say it again. You guys get to reflect on it. Reflect on the sin, but um, trust in the spirit. Fan the spirit, help it, let it guide you, let it do what it's supposed to do. And the other part of this too, if you're anything, I'm sure, I'm sure you, it's a common thing. I know I've talked about it with, with some folks. Um, there's a tendency to to doubt your salvation, particularly when you're sinning. There's there's a real urge to go, oh boy, and Satan's right there to accuse. And to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right about that. You you are in fact, you are in fact not worthy. You you probably should be going to hell. And uh, but by being aware that you're thinking this way, by by even having that thought, it shows that the spirit is working in you. So rest in it. Rest in it. But again, ultimately, you got to do what you can. To fan the spirit, let the spirit work through you. Pray, gather, all the things. Um, but ultimately, it's not it's not us that are doing anything. Um, Jeff, don't you think every time we resist that temptation to a specific sin, every time we resist it, it pushes it further back and makes it weaker and goes away more? Or do you think it stays just as strong? And I mean, you know, because some of us have temptations in some areas, and other people have temptations in other areas. Sure. So, uh, but I think that every time you say, no, I'm not going to do that, I am not going to do that, yep. you push it further away. Yeah. 
there's definitely a real aspect to like sin begets sin. So the more you sin, the more you uh, you know you you let this little area go here. It's easier to do that other thing over there. The more you practice, yeah, it's a snowball effect. Um, the more that you you resist it, you get to reflect on it after that. And it, if you if you feel yourself in a, if you are able, again, one of the fruit of the spirit, self control. If you're able to control yourself from it, and so let's say you're in a situation, you're like, man, I could lie right now, and you don't lie, and instead you just tell the truth. There's, you get something out of that. Don't, don't let it puff you up, but let it be. Oh man, look at that! The spirit is working in me right now in this very moment. So yeah, so you do get something out of it as you, uh, you know, as you walk through a sin or as you push it aside and, uh, and walk in the spirit, but. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it necessarily uh, makes it any easier, but yeah, I'd say there's maybe to some extent. What's everybody else think? You think it makes it easier? Well, it's good on the big screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, it fans the spirit. Yeah. It, like it that. Yeah. Well, well, I like the visual of that gets smaller. So I almost like the big visual of other of the spirit gets bigger. And right. The flesh or you gets allow bigger. that uh-huh. to work. Well, it's just about the time you think you have it under control, it yeah. sneaks up behind you yeah. <laughs> and trips you up again. Yep. And then the difficult part with it, too, is it's not really you that's doing it. It's the but Spirit it, conforming you to the image of Christ. It's, it's also being able to recognize when God does something in your life. Yeah. Give them the credit for it. Yeah. Give them credit where credit's due. All good things come from it. So. Yeah, and then the last piece to this, we were saved, we're being saved presently, and we will be saved finally. So, again, there's assurance, there is assurance, <laughs> there is also uh, a call to action in you know, sin working, uh, working and hurting us. But again, the big, the big takeaway here, reflect on it. Be disgusted by it, let it hurt you, but ultimately, faith and trust, and let it let it work through you for through the sanctification process until until we reach glory. So that's it. Um, and if we are re- sorry, no. if we're regretting our sin after asking for forgiveness, then we're not believing in forgiveness and everything you just said about this assurance. So if we're reflecting on our sin after we have already lifted it up and of asking help us not to and we're not actually believing in forgiveness we're not actually believing in God's ability to save us yeah. for Jesus to be the one who wipes away all sin sure yeah so that's trust it keep it up sure for mm-hmm. sure again don't reflect on it let it let it build you up and then throw behind that's all we got final thoughts mm-hmm. question God's grace is greater than our struggles Amen. Probably could have just said that. (laughs) (laughs) Anyhow, that's what we got. Somebody want to close us in prayer, please. Jamie, how about you? Thank you. Gracious Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this uh, opportunity together, Lord. I thank you for Jeff. Lord, I thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your grace, Lord. We pray that you uh, be with us as we go. Help us to. Fan the flame of your spirit, Lord. Feed the spirit. Don't quench the spirit as we go through our week, Lord. Be with those who are traveling. Uh, be with us as we go, Lord, and return back to gather together again, Lord. And God, we love you because you first loved us and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good job, Jeff. Good. Absolutely. Good.